This afternoon we will be talking about global public goods. So global public goods are not new concepts. Uh, it has been there for quite a while. These are goods and services that affects people, uh, communities that are beyond just any one boundary, any one uh, generation. Uh, essentially, it affects a lot of people. So this afternoon, we would talk about this, uh, know more about global public goods, why they are important, what are the challenges uh, in providing global public goods, and what should we be doing. Um, so, maganda hapon po sa inyong lahat. So, friends, uh, colleagues from government, uh, partners uh, in development, maganda uh, hapon. We have uh, five presentations uh, this afternoon. We will start with uh, public health, uh, environment, and then international rule of law. Uh, each presentation would have 20 minutes, and then uh, we have uh, someone checking your time. So let's start uh, this afternoon's uh, session uh, with a presentation from Professor uh, Gavin Yami, who is a professor of practice of global health and public policy, the director of the Center for Policy Impact and Global Health, and associate director for policy at the Duke Global Health Institute. Uh, Dr. Yami is a deputy editor of the Western Journal of Medicine, assistant editor of the British Medical Journal, uh, a founding senior editor of PLOS Medicine, and a principal investigator on a 1.1 million US dollar grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to support the launch of the PLOS Neglected Tropical Diseases uh, Journal. Uh, Professor uh, Yami previously served on three international health commissions, including the Lancet Commission on Investing in Health, the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, and the Lancet Commission on Tuberculosis. Uh, he will not be with us uh, today uh, physically, but he will be presenting uh, through a, a recorded video. Professor of Global Health and Public Policy here at Duke University, and I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk to you today about financing of what we call global functions um, and what the WHO is calling global common goods for health, which I will explain in a minute. I'm sorry that I could not be with you in person today. The work that I'm presenting today is part of a new program of work led by the WHO on financing common goods for health, and there will be a special issue of the journal Health Systems and Reform coming out in September, it is timed for the UN General Assembly, and in that special issue you will see that there are seven papers on this topic of common goods for health. The first is on when both markets and governments fail health. The second is on the case for common goods. The third is what is needed for governments to succeed when it comes to the financing of common goods for health. The fourth is on core government functions in health emergency and disaster risk. The fifth paper looks at the national agenda, uh, financing common goods at the national level. The sixth paper, the one that I uh, co-authored and led, that is on financing of global common goods for health. And the seventh is on the, the case for public financing of environmental common goods for health. And today, in the next 10 minutes or so, I'm going to focus on the paper that I co-authored on financing global common goods for health. In this series, we are addressing a number of questions. What do we mean by common goods for health? Why today have they not been financed by markets or by governments? What would it cost to adequately finance them? 
what are the country level financing mechanisms and challenges, and as I'm going to talk about today, what are the potential global level financing mechanisms and challenges. Let me just briefly give you the definition that we're using in this series uh, on common goods for health. This term refers to population-based functions or interventions that require collective financing, either from government or donors or both, based on the following conditions. They contribute to health progress and economic progress, and there's a very clear economic rationale for these interventions based on market failures, with a particular focus on public goods, as you know, economists define those as being non-rival and non-exclusionary, or there are large social externalities. And the series makes the point that not all public or common goods are within this definition, and vice versa, but all common goods for health must generate large societal health benefits that can't be financed through market forces alone. So that sets the scene, covers the sort of definitional issues, and now I want to focus very specifically on global common goods for health. In the larger Commission on Investing in Health, Global Health 2035, which came out in the Lancet in December 2013, we, the commissioners, actually used the term global function. Um, that's really another way of saying global common goods for health. And what we talked about when we talked about these functions were activities that address transnational health issues that go beyond the boundaries of individual nations. And so when you invest in global functions, you derive by definition transnational benefits. And we categorize these global functions into three types. Supporting global public goods, like generating and sharing health knowledge across borders, uh, or market shaping to bring down the prices of drugs, or setting international norms and standards, those all fall into the first category of supporting global public goods. The second of fostering leadership and stewardship, um, like convening for consensus building. And the third category, of global functions, managing cross-border regional and global externalities, for example, outbreak preparedness and response, or responding to antimicrobial resistance. In our paper that is coming out in September on financing global common goods, we lay out a, an investment case, if you like, a value proposition. We argue that there are at least five uh, reasons why it is valuable to invest in global common goods for health, like pandemic preparedness or research and development for diseases of poverty. The first is that if we do nothing, the costs are actually extraordinary. Uh, for example, Victoria Fan, Dean Jameson, Larry Summers showed in a paper in the WHO Bulletin that the expected annual losses from pandemic risks are around $500 million a year. There is also research by Naylor and colleagues that show that if the current rates of antimicrobial resistance continue, the annual GDP loss in 40 years from now would be around $454 billion. So the costs of doing nothing are enormous. Secondly, if we do invest in global functions, the payoffs are very large. There are very impressive health and economic returns. Um, so, for example, the returns to investing in an HIV vaccine will be very large um, when eventually we develop them. Uh, Rob Hecht, Dean Jameson, and colleagues showed, for example, that if by 2030 we were, we were able to develop an HIV vaccine of even partial efficacy, 50% efficacy, for example, and if those investments have been around 900 million a year, uh, which is what we're currently spending, then the returns are still going to be orders of magnitude uh, greater than the investment, somewhere between two and 70 dollars in returns for every dollar 
invested. And we know that there are similar examples of large returns to investing in other global functions, like market shaping for the pentavalent vaccine. It is also possible that investing in transnational activities, global functions, could have, in the end, greater benefit for low and middle income countries than the direct funding of services because the funding of global functions could be less fungible. It also could be a way to address the so-called middle income dilemma. Middle income dilemma is that middle income countries, as you know, are now graduating out of development assistance for health. They've reached a national income level the GDP per capita that is disqualifying them from receiving aid, and yet around 70% of the world's poor are in those transitioning middle-income countries. And so there is a dilemma. They don't qualify for aid, and yet most poverty, most poverty-related Ill, Ill health is now in middle-income countries and not low-income countries. And we argue that actually investing in these global functions could be a very powerful way to continue to improve the health of the poor in middle income countries. So for example, if you take MDR TB, multi-drug resistant TB, affected communities in middle income countries would benefit from product development, from market shaping to reduce prices, and from collective purchasing. And our fifth argument is that middle income countries are going to be graduating away from official development assistance for health. And so there is an opportunity uh, for aid reallocation. This direct country support could be invested in global functions. We argue also that you can actually invest in global functions at multiple different levels. You can invest at the global level, the supranational level, for example, investing in the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations or on global vaccine stockpiles, those are global investments in global common goods for health. You can invest in the regional level, for example, investing in the Africa CDC or in regional malaria elimination initiatives. And you can also invest in global common goods at the country level. If, for example, you invest in malaria elimination or in tackling drug-resistant tuberculosis, those have transnational benefits. So how much are we currently spending on global common goods for health? I have co-authored a paper led by Marco Schaeferhoff that will also be coming out uh, in September in this special issue of Health Systems and Reform. And we actually quantified uh, donor spending on global common goods for health. And we looked at the years 2013, 2015, and 2017. 2017 is the most recent year for which uh, data are available. And you can see in this slide that in 2013, out of the $25.7 billion in total ODA for health, less than a quarter was spent on global common goods for health. That proportion has changed. It went up to 29% uh, in 2015 and then down again to 24% in 2017. You do see in the wake of Ebola, that there was a temporary increase in spending on global common goods for health, um, which then fell post Ebola. How much do we need? We estimate, based on the work of the Commission on investing in health and on the upcoming study done for the Lancet Commission on Malaria Eradication, that an additional 11.5 billion is needed annually to invest in global common goods for health. And that is a conservative uh, estimate. What does that 11.5 billion entail? It's product development, pandemic preparedness, polio eradication, malaria eradication, funding of the WHO's core activities, uh, the global public good that the WHO supports, a pool procurement mechanism for non-communicable diseases, and population policy and implementation research. You'll remember earlier I said that the costs of inaction are enormous, many hundreds of billion a year, and so actually that really puts this figure into perspective. 11 and a half billion compared to many hundreds of billion, it's a very important uh, and feasible investment. 
This next slide summarizes the approaches that we lay out in our work on how you could close this financing gap. And you can do it in three broad ways. Mobilizing resources, for example, through compulsory mechanisms like global taxation. We've seen a growing uh, appetite for global taxation uh, on a, for a financial transaction tax, tax on carbon. We know that Unitaid, for example, is funded by a tax on airline tickets. Voluntary earmarks mechanisms. We have seen, for example, SEPI uh, mobilizing funding for pandemic vaccine developments. Uh, that is clearly a way to raise money. That does, of course, risk the proliferation and fragmentation of the global health architecture. So you would still need an overarching governance structure, I would argue best provided by WHO. And a third way, reallocation of ODA, ODA as I mentioned, after middle-income countries graduate out of direct country support. A second approach is through the pooling of funding. Uh, for example, the pooling of research and development funding, new coordination platforms like the G20 Global Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Hub, um, or pooling of multilateral agency funding. Uh, my own centre here, the Centre for Policy Impacting Global Health, the Duke Global Health Institute has recently published a, uh, an analysis looking at how the four major multilateral agencies in health, WHO, World Bank, uh, Gavi and the Global Fund, are very interested in uh, combining forces and collaborating more on funding of global public goods. And our third approach that we lay out is the strategic purchasing of global common goods for health. We know, for example, that Gavi is involved in pool procurement and market shaping. The Global Fund has an initiative, $194 million for strategic initiatives. Many of those are global public goods, such as malaria elimination. We know that IDA, for example, uh, funds laboratory networks uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. The WHO, we argue in our paper, has a very key role as an overarching governance mechanism. We say, actually, in our paper that the most radical shift to close this financing gap would be shifting the way that WHO itself is financed. Um, if you look at the WHO's core functions, those really reflect its role as the global health governance body. And if you look at the general program of work for 2019 to 2013, global public goods are absolutely at the heart of that program of work. And yet, voluntary contributions extra budgetary funds now make up almost 80% of WHO's funding, and those are very heavily earmarked. And we argued in the Commission on Investing in Health that as a result of earmarking, WHO is struggling to fund its core functions, undermining its capacity to supply global public goods and other global functions. So we have to address this dilemma if we are going to address uh, the funding gap, the critical funding gap for common goods for health. I hope that has been um, a, uh, a useful overview of the landscape of um, the financing of global common goods for health. Thank you for your time. Uh, the next presentation will also be uh, in public health. Uh, it will be presented by Dr. Susan Pineda Mercado. Uh, Dr. Susan Mercado is a medical doctor in public health expert with over 30 years of experience in national and international public health systems. She is a recognized women leader, woman leader for transformative public health through her engagement in media, civil society, and humanitarian action. In the past 15 years, she had a distinguished career with the World Health Organization, where she led the response to some of the most complex challenges of public health today. She was recognized as one of the 100 most influential Filipino women in the world in the category of innovator and thought leader by the US-based Filipino Women's Network in 2018. Recently, she was designated as Special Envoy of the President for Global Health Initiatives of France, uh, Dr. Bertrand. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's see. Okay. 
Um, thank you for uh, this opportunity to, to share. Thank you to the organizers of, of this particular session. I've entitled my presentation 110 Million Solutions to Health, referring to 110 million Filipinos. I think um, if we talk about global health and public health, we have to start with a very uncomfortable truth. The, the, um, the world is wealthier than ever before, but it's not necessarily healthier. And in the case of the Philippines, we graduated from being a uh, uh, recipient of donor money to now a very self-sufficient middle-income country, and yet the health goals and outcomes that we desire have yet to be, have yet to be achieved. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the Philippines compared to the, the previous presentation. But uh, my thesis is that if we want to improve health outcomes in this country, we have to reverse our thinking about how health is created. And it's not created by more doctors and nurses and health facilities or even health financing. But it's, it, is, uh, it is achieved through health literacy empowered populations, people knowing how to achieve better health and healthier environments and of course healthier settings in the places where people live, learn, work and play. Um, okay, so I always like to start with a photo of the earth um, just to remind us that uh, we have to contextualize health outcomes in relation to, to the physical environment. And um, I know our colleagues Jerome is going to talk a bit about a bit climbing, but I can't be responsible for me to not talk about increasing surface temperatures in the world and its impact on on health, not just uh, in the whole world, but in the Philippines in particular. And uh, in this particular slide, you see that from the year 1880 to uh, the year 2000, about 2005, 2010, there's been a steady increase in uh, the surface temperature of the world. And this is from last year, where Beijing reported a um, 40 degree, uh, 40 degrees temperature in the atmosphere. Now, for those of you who are doctors, um, 37.8 is a fever. So living in an environment that's 40 degrees is like living in in a situation where you you are you're having a high fever. And um, this, there have been a number of heat waves in the past year. Uh, Europe, for example, Greece, countries have the capability of actually measuring excess mortality from heat waves in the same way that they can measure excess mortality from extreme, extremely cold environments. 